Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another First Friday. Glad to see you all here. The First Friday is sponsored by the Woodside Arts and Culture Committee from the town of Woodside, a group of like-minded volunteers who are here to provide our community with interesting programming. And this evening, we present um, another interesting program based on the coming of spring and summer. We have two fantastic uh, gardeners that will be presenting here this evening. We have Lisa and Kathleen Putnam, who will be um, providing us information regarding how to prepare your gardens for the spring and summer. You know, uh, I enjoy gardening. Um, last year, um, my wife and I probably had close to 300 pounds of tomatoes that we uh, managed to put together. So there's something so satisfying about gardening, about planting something and watching it, it grow. And it, it goes to um, a quote by Alfred Austin that I really enjoy. And he kind of describes the whole experience. He says, the glory of gardening, hands in the dirt, head in the sun, heart with nature, to nurture a garden is to feed not just on the body, but the soul. And I think after watching, viewing this evening's presentation, you will feel the same, that gardening can not just bring about life from the earth, but it can definitely feed your soul. And we have two master gardeners who are going to tell us how to prepare for this fantastic activity. So without further ado, we would like to welcome Kathleen and Lisa Putnam to share their program with us. So thank you very much for presenting here this evening. We really appreciate and appreciate the opportunity to be with you this evening. Um, so I am going to go ahead and start. Um, the, first, uh, the first nine slides or so are a garden in Central Woodside, and it's um, the name of the farm is Mission Farm. So about eight months ago, it looked like the picture on your left. It was just a blank palette with uh, pretty much nothing growing. So we were kind of starting from ground zero. And <clears throat> three months later, you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, it looked like a jungle. <laughs> so I, it it can go very quickly. I mean, Mother Mother Earth is extraordinarily generous. And if you give um, if you give things a chance, they're going to grow. That's what they want to do. So I just wanted to share this is um, this is a farm that I am running with twelve other uh, gardeners, master gardeners, and um, we're really having a lot of fun. They're amazing people, amazing gardeners, and um, just so happy and honored to be working with them. And so, how did we get there? So. You saw May 7th with nothing. The first thing we did is we covered the soil. Um, you do not want bare soil under any circumstances. So by May 10th, we had the soil covered. It was either covered with hay, um, but any kind of mulch is fine. We seeded some beds and those we put a floating row cover over. Within, uh, let's see, May 3rd, within, Two weeks, we had our tomatoes planted. We're having some issues with some rats. We put a floating row cover, and actually, that did the trick. We um, we stopped losing tomatoes to rats. And um, you can see a few of the gardeners there. It's me on the left, next to Brian Martinez, our male gardener, and our gopher trapper extraordinaire, Karen and Carrie. So these are um, a few of the gardeners that we're working with. Um, and you'll hear the same thing throughout this whole presentation, but don't step on your soil. Do not compact your soil. Keep your soil light and fluffy and put your feet on the wood chips or paths, but do not step on your soil. Um, so just to continue the magic, um, that's me on the left-hand side. So we, about mid May, mid to late May, we seeded some corn. By August 8th, the corn must have been uh, eight feet tall. I'm about five something. And 
<laughs> it's just amazing how uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 another thing I'll be saying, all, but it, it's so generous. The earth is so generous. If you just give these things what they want and what they need, they're going to grow and they're going to produce. That's one of our gardeners, Jenny. We, at the end of the season, we were trying to eke out a few more tomatoes. We had tomatoes that, again, were eight feet tall and uh, we we're running out of daylight. The days were getting shorter, but we wanted those tomatoes to ripen up. And we were, the whole thing, our whole farm is an experiment. And we were experimenting by taking off some foliage and seeing if we could get those tomatoes to ripe up. It, it kind of worked. Um, in November, we took out that corn. We put in some tiny little seedlings of cabbage and um, cauliflower. And by November, we're, we are on to our second crop of um, harvesting cabbage and cauliflower. Um, the main thing we do, and Kathleen will get into this in a minute, uh, we cover crop everything. So no bare soil. And we spend a lot of time, these faithful, wonderful gardeners, spend a lot of time chopping and dropping. So we put in mustards and grasses and California wildflowers, and we chop them at the top, chop, 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 and they drop to the ground. They become, uh, they're living mulch while they're alive. We chop and drop them. They become, they dry and become mulch. We always leave the roots in the ground. The roots are what's feeding the soil food web. What is going through our minds constantly is how do we feed the microbes in the soil? We're not worried about the plants. The plants will take care of themselves. We're worried about keeping that soil alive because it's the soil that is feeding that plant. And the more you chop and drop, the more carbon you're pumping into your soil. And that's what you want a carbon-based system. So keep chopping and dropping your cover crop and we'll get into that. Um, we planted a hedgerow. So um, that's gardener Deanne planting the hedgerow for us. I went to Filoli in October. They had all their stuff like, I think 30 or 50% off. So I bought a whole bunch of California natives. Um, and I'm a huge, huge fan of Doug Tallamy. And that's his, um, on the right-hand side of your screen, it's kind of his philosophy. But when you're planting other than your fruits and vegetables plant california natives um you're trying to bring in the good beneficial insects and so up at top i have some beneficial insects ladybug that's supposed to be a soldier beetle i don't know what it really is and butterflies bees and um i like that little dinosaur because he's so cute um <laughs> he's not really a beneficial insect but um, he, he might have been at some time he probably was um, but, and, and the main thing is insects are good. We, um, we got a cat, Kathleen and I taught a class last weekend and it was like, well, how do you, you know, how do you keep your insects out? And like, I don't, I don't try to keep insects out. I try to keep insects in. I, I want insects. They're, Kathleen, you know, the statistic, but it's like 95% of them are beneficial. They're good or neutral. I think it's 98%. So a huge, huge percent are, are good guys. So don't, don't kill insects um and if you have bad guys the good guys are gonna come and eat them yeah so i don't we don't do anything for insects um after i started thinking about the question so um here is us again and we start everything from seed but we've got a pretty big farm so i mean we're starting 800 seedlings at a time we just can't afford to go buy those it'd be too expensive so um and we'll get into how we prep these beds, but we um, we put on compost and you can see Gardener Liz there. We put on about a two or three inch layer of homemade compost and, um, and then we cover crop. Right after we put the compost down, we throw out, toss out some cover crop seeds and then we plant into that. So you can see on the right hand side, those are three week old broccolis. Those are little tiny baby broccolis. I usually do a, a six week, but we tried a three week and we had amazing results. We had, it, it was incredible, but we went from, from seed to harvest in 60 days, which is wow. unusual, unusual. But um, I think it speaks to our good soil. We have pure sun and uh, correct watering and we'll get into all of that too. So, 
um, compost. So I mentioned we make our own compost. We do. <laughs> um, but again, since we're more on a, a little bit bigger than a bar backyard garden scale, we collect, you can see on the left-hand side, um, yeah, my mouse doesn't work, but on the left-hand side, we just stockpile leaves. We stockpile everything in the garden. When we take out a crop, we, we cut it at soil level. We leave those roots in the ground and we took, put the tops into our storage of uh, stockpiling of our um, all the stuff that's going to be composted. If you can, you try to do about a four carbon to one nitrogen, which means dried leaves. You don't want to take dried leaves away from underneath your tree, but if you have them on your driveway or on your parking area, you can go ahead and, and gather up those dried leaves, put them in your compost pile. Um, and then everybody was amazed, every single gardener, all 12 of them were amazed. All you do then as after you store all that um, is you turn it, we turn it with a tractor. If it's a nine by nine pile, you're gonna turn it by hand um, or three, sorry, three by three pile, nine cubic feet. Um, we turn ours with a tractor, not we, but Luis, the amazing, wonderful Luis turns it. He adds a little water to it. So you're just adding water and air. And within three weeks, you have amazing compost. The longer you let it sit, the better it is. Um, so that pile right there that he's turning, we're using it now. That's what we're using. Uh, we're about right now, we're February's the month. We're about to start planting out again. So we're we're prepping all our beds. We do sift it. We get a lot of wood chips in ours because our whole, everything's mulched. Um, so you can see me sifting it there on the bottom. And, oh, and then we make a lot of food. <laughs> um, so this is, um, we're growing this all for, uh, for food banks. So um, the gardeners bring it to local food banks. And this is just, this is just uh, a few random pictures, but we're harvesting twice a week. We've harvest. I'm. We do have a. We don't really have a good way of weighing it. My guess is it's it's thousands of pounds of produce that we're bringing to to food banks, and um, I all get teary. But I'm just so proud of all these gardeners. They're just really wonderful people doing uh, really really wonderful work, and I'm just. It's an honor to work with them. And, uh, and hopefully we're supplying some really delicious organic food to uh, people who need it. So that is that. And now we're gonna go into kind of the, the where, why, how, when of what we do. Um, so you only really have to have three things, um, but it's helpful if you have six things to be a good gardener, but you have to have sun you have to have living soil and you have to have water. Um, it's helpful if you also have patience and that's the little heart down there, curiosity, and that's Inspector Clouseau and um, the power of observation and that's the thumbs up. It, I, I'm gonna actually, those are essential as well because you have to be asking yourself all the time, why is this working? Why isn't this working? Why? Do I have aphids and it's not the end of the plant life? Why? So you're just constantly asking yourself, you know, questions of what's going on and, and researching and learning. And, um, but the essentials from the physical world are you need full sun and that's six hours a day for your, your leafy vegetables and your root crops and for your fruiting vegetables to make everything you grow in summer is a fruiting quote vegetable. Um, and you need at least eight hours and that's direct sun. That's not dappled light. That's sun hitting the leaves of the plant, photosynthesizing, pumping carbon into the root. Um, and with the correct sun, you can avoid a lot of heartache. With correct sun, living soil and correct water, your plant is gonna thrive. I will guarantee it. Um, so those, that is what you need. Um, where to garden. So we garden in the ground. Kathleen and I are both kind of big proponents of gardening directly in the soil. On the left-hand side is my home garden in Portola Valley, and you'll see raised beds 
I have actually taken out four of the raised beds and I'm, I'm switching to the ground. Um, I'm leaving four raised beds. The benefit of raised beds, you, you don't ever step on your soil. It's nice. You don't even have to think about it. You're not going to get up there and step on your soil and you have more control. You can, you can see in the far four raised beds, which are now gone, but they're covered because I have new brassicas in there. And I find you get bird damage with little tiny seedlings. Um, and it's just, e it, it is easier to control your environment. All these raised beds have a, I have a gopher issue where I live and I have a gopher issue at the farm too, but, um, but I have hardware cloth on the bottom of those raised beds. So it's just, you can control your environment better with raised beds. So that's the benefit. Um, the benefit of growing in the ground is you're growing in your native soil. You're going to get more flavor of the soil into your vegetables. It's a living soil. You have a living system. You do in raised beds too. You just sometimes have to work a little harder. Um, so we both enjoy growing right into the ground. Um, that's more oops, nutrients in it. More nutrients. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say so too. Um, Kathleen, you want to talk about the soil food web? Yeah, um, I, I think the most important element of the soil food web is the sun up in the left-hand corner hitting the plants right below them because the magic of our existence is photosynthesis. Without photosynthesis, we would not exist. So the sun hits the leaves on that plant, the plant uh, makes carbon out of sunlight, which is amazing and scientists still don't know exactly how it's done. And plants give between 30 and 60% of that carbon that it made into the soil because the plants know it needs to feed all of the life in the soil for its own benefit. And the, the, the microbes in the soil make the soil healthy and alive and bring nutrients to the plant. It's a symbiotic relationship. The microbes in the soil know if the soil is good and alive and full of nutrients, then the plant is going to survive and do well and keep feeding them. So that's kind of the soil food web. Um, and so how you feed the soil food web, how do you keep all those microbes alive? <coughs> Excuse me. Is you cover crop. Cover crop, which is you grow a diversity of plants and you always have roots in the ground. Um, and we feed the soil food web compost. That life in the soil comes up into the compost. We don't turn it in. We don't do any tilling. Um, the put the compost on all those little microorganisms come up and they grab what they need they bring it down um just like the roots um so keep your soil covered keep it covered with cover crops with mulch um don't till your soil all those microbes know where they want to be in the soil they're all stratified so when you go with a shovel and you turn that soil it's just like somebody taking your house and turning your house upside down. <coughs> Excuse me. It's very, very disturbing to them. And then they have to re-stratify. They have to spend a bunch of energy getting back up to top, the ones who are supposed to be at the top. And so, so don't turn your soil. Um, if you're growing in raised beds, fill them with Lingso Veggie Blend. We're not part of Lingso, but it's, they make some really, really good products. Um, Sorry, and um, you wouldn't go bare naked. Don't let your soil go naked. <laughs> um, Kathleen, you want to cover some more about? About, yeah, because why you feed the soil web is almost identical to why you cover crop is you're increasing your organic matter. You're feeding the soil organisms. You're increasing your water holding capacity. And I must say in this last big rain we had, I had no puddling or ponding in my yard at all. 
Um, you get good water infiltration and it improves your soil structure. You get nice aggregates and it's your soil. You could stick your arm all the way in up to your shoulder if you have really nice soil. Yeah, the soil's like butter. Yeah, it's really lovely. And then, yeah, most importantly, if you're taking care of your soil, there's no need for herbicides or pesticides or fertilizer. We don't fertilize. I mean, we put compost on, but we don't use fertilizer. Um, one of the gardeners once, we were having trouble with a couple of our rows, and one of the gardeners once said, um, well, maybe we should fertilize. And I went, oh! <gasps> <laughs> I've been I've been gardening there for 15 years. I've never used fertilizer, organic or otherwise, but um, uh, soil management. Um, so Kathleen, ha Kathleen and I have some heroes, and Gabe Brown is one of our heroes. Kathleen emailed him, and he emailed back. Yes, <laughs> I emailed him about keeping my blueberry soil acidic, and he said cover crop with. Um, a higher mix of grasses. Okay. Did it work? Did your yeah. uh, oh my blueberries are doing great. Yeah, yeah. It all comes back to the same thing. So these are his five principles, but disturb your soil as little as possible. Don't step on it. Don't till it. Um, grow living plants always, 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 always have roots in the ground. And I think it was Chris Nichols, Kathleen and I have gone to classes with some of these really fabulous soil scientists and um I think it was Chris Nichols. I think she's from Nebraska. She came out to California to give a talk and she was driving in the Central Valley and there was a bunch of farms without things growing in their soil. And in winter. Yeah. Yeah. So she just, I guess, I don't know if we're allowed to swear, but anyway, every farm she went by, she was just like, dumb shit, dumb shit. Dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, and, and and then I was just listening to a talk by Christine Jones and um, about cover crop. She's from Australia about how to keep your soil alive. And Australia is having a huge, huge problem right now. And it's, oh, it's just so sad because they're tilling their soil and they're getting bigger and bigger tillers and they're going deeper down and they're ripping their soil. They're destroying their soil. And um it, it, hurt, it hurts obviously it hurts christine jones's heart and um and she said she knew when she was five years old that having bare soil was not right she just she just knew it in her bones that you should never have bare soil and um, anyway some remarkable women soil scientists that are our heroes and um so cover your soil keep your soil covered and um, you can go visit. We went up to Singing Frog Farm up in Sebastopol. There are no till uh, farm. And um, probably everybody by now has watched Kiss the Ground. If you haven't, watch it. It's, it's really, it's well worth your time. Um, other movies, Living Soil, Symphony of Soil. So um, some good. And one of the, I can't remember the author. The Soil Will Save Us. It's also, it's, it's how we're going to take carbon out of our air and put it into our ground where it belongs is is growing plants and trees so uh kathleen you want to talk about cover cropping yeah like if you notice the benefits of cover cropping are almost exactly the same as feeding your soil because this or or yeah feeding your soil because because this is how you feed your soil but a cover crop you want to have at least i used to say eight different plants but i also just listened to the talk that lisa did and really you need at least four families of plants to have a diversity of plants to feed the soil it's like if all you ate was a burger king you know breakfast lunch and dinner you're not going to be happy but if you ate three different meals of three different things and you know you're you're going to be healthy so your soil is the same it's alive it's a it's a living super organism really so you need to feed it and by feeding it then it's going to take care of your plants and when you feed it you get the structure of soil increase organic matter 
um, you want to protect the soil service surface, you do that with plants. It improves the water infiltration, retention, cycle, sequester, nutrients, and carbon. In fact, there's some research being done now that if every farmer cover cropped, we could reverse climate change. Mm -hmm. All the carbon that's up in the atmosphere that belongs down in the ground and used to, in fact, be down in the ground, we could put it back down in the ground by cover cropping and by not tilling. So if you cover crop with, she said four families, I'm inclined to say five, and, and not a legume, you don't need a legume. They have discovered free living bacteria that fix nitrogen. So you don't need to put legumes in the ground in, in your cover crop mix. Um, you're gonna have great soil. Yeah. And it, it occurs to me, I don't know if we define cover cropping, um, but simply what it is, is growing a crop that you're not going to eat. You're growing that crop for the soil. So, um, so you're, you're putting, when we put down our compost, we, we just throw out, we probably are throwing out 16 or 17 different types of seeds. And that's just, um, it, almost anything can be a cover crop, but you're feeding it back to the soil. You're not feeding your bodies with it. Um, and then I put the little thing in here, roots in the ground, not boots on the ground, just to remind everybody to grow a cover crop and don't step on your soil when you step and, on your and soil. And don't grow hairy vetch. You'll never get rid of it. Yeah, I think I have that in the next, I know. I crossed out vetch. Um, this is one yeah. more cover crop slide and then we will move on because I know we've talked about cover crop a lot. But um, I, so I, these are some seeds you could use for cover cropping. Um, I like in the last slide, Larner's. Um, well, yeah. I love Larner's seeds. God, they have such beautiful seeds, but also nature seeds. Um, they have a California wildflower mix, which I think is a really nice, it's a nice blend for your cover crop. And um, these slides, we're gonna be on a YouTube thing. So if you aren't jotting this all down, you could just watch it on YouTube and then stop on this slide and take down information or, or take a photo of it, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, a YouTube thing? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it, it's, I think having too much, I, I just agree with Christine Jones and I put legume in there, but maybe one legume, but you don't want a ton of legumes in your cover crop mix. Um, but grasses, and buckwheat's one of my favorite. It just pops right up. Like you sow it and the next day it's up and, it, um, and it's pretty too. And it brings in some beneficial insects. Um, but it, the grasses are really nice because their their roots are um, very dense and they spread out really nicely. They do a really nice job of breaking up compacted soil, and so do daikon radishes. Yeah, they do a great job of busting up compact soil. Yep. yep. All right, we're moving on to our next subject: watering. <laughs> Um, we water with drip irrigation at the farm. We do something called tea tape, um, here at my house in Portola Valley. We just do an inline admitter. Um, and I guess just pay attention. Usually October, I turn the system off altogether and don't turn it on till late spring. If we're having a normal winter, I don't think there's such a thing as a normal winter anymore, but you know, last winter when we had all that rain in December, then we went 10 weeks without any rain and I had to water. I had, I had to turn the water system on. Um, but the days are very short. You don't have a lot of sunlight. Um, you don't need that much water even when we don't have rain in the winter. Um, if you're gonna water by hand, when I first started gardening, I watered by hand instead of having a drip irrigation. And I did that purposefully um, and I did it for a couple of years, but it's just, you really, you really understand what that plant needs. And so much of, 
of being a gardener is the conversation with the plant and expert certainly with a with a pruner it's the conversation with the tree but um really paying attention and seeing how much water it needs it needs way 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 less water than most people think way less um so you can we do a class on dry farming um i think it's april 22nd at, in san mateo at the public library but um Anyway, you don't need as much water as you think. And I, I think what happens is people say, oh, well, I have my system on. It's going on three times a week. I have it running for 10 minutes. And unless you know how much water is coming out of each emitter, that doesn't tell us anything. And we might have a cool summer. We might have a hot summer. We might have a windy summer. We might. So it, it, it varies. You can't just, it's not a kind of a one and done. Um, do you have something to add, Kathleen? Yeah, it's even it's even worse than that. When I worked at the nursery and, you know, customers would come in with a problem with their plant. And my first question was always, well, how often is it getting watered? And probably about a half the time they would say, well, it's on an irrigation system. Well, that, that's not an answer. And if you don't know what your irrigation is set to, then you need to find out. You need to talk to your gardener, or whoever is in charge of it, and adjust it, or you know, be a little bit more involved in your irrigation system, because just having one it, that that doesn't solve the issue. Yeah, yeah. And then the only other thing I will add: the Dram Redhead in the bottom left there. If you are going to hand water, or you need some supplemental water during the summer you don't want like a hose without a, you know, a nice way to disperse the water. So it's like um, rain. So it feels like rain to the plant. Um, all right. When we think of gardening, we think of three seasons. So um, there we are out in the garden with a group of master gardeners. Um, so right now it's go time. It's, it's February and you are now getting in all your brassicas. We'll get into the families, but Right now you're getting in all your broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and that whole family. Um, and you can do that February going into March. Um, you're starting to seed, you're starting to get all your root crops in right now, carrots and parsnips, um, starting to seed your lettuces and arugula. So it's really, you guys are taking this class at the right time. This is the time to really to to get on it um your summer so you plant kind of three times a year you put compost down three times a year right before you plant your summer crops late april early may your tomatoes your eggplant your cucumbers everything in your soliensia and cucurbit family and then fall and winter crops are the same as your spring crops so you start in august and that's where you're putting in again all your brassicas and your um I still call it chenopodaisy, but it's your amaranth family, um, spinach and um, beets and chard. Um, so those all go in right now. And then again in August, you can see you're still going to be having your tomatoes and eggplant and peppers are still going to be in the ground. They're still going to be producing. So you have to intercrop. You have to plant those brassicas in with your tomatoes. Um, which let's see if this is the slide, Kathleen, maybe it is. You, you want to actually be precede your tomatoes with a broccoli crop. And you want to, after you take your tomatoes out, cut them at soil level, leave those roots in, compost the tops. You want to go in with, bro you want to go in with broccoli. Um, it has been found that broccoli reduces your load of verticillium. So you want to um, keep the load low of verticillium in your soil. So pre-seed actually, if you can, with two crops, a, a fall and a spring crop of broccoli and then plant out your tomatoes there. If your uh, tomatoes have verticillium, should you take out the roots? Have you done that, Kathleen? Have you taken out the roots if they have verticillium? I haven't, but after we found out one of our clients had tomatoes with verticillium, I looked it up. Mm -hmm. And according to UC Davis, you should take out those roots. Okay. That'd be very one of the very few times we wouldn't leave roots in the soil is if you have a diseased plant, did you put it in the compost pile, Kathleen? 
Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, I would just be, you know, if if let's say your um, fruit tree has fire blight, your your apple or your pear tree has fire blight. If you have disease stuff, there is something I never put in the compost pile, and that's field bindweed. We cut it at soil level, but I don't put the tops in the compost pile. So if it's diseased, you can play it safe and not put it in your compost pile. But it, I can tell you, if you're growing it in sun and living soil and the correct amount of water, it's really going to reduce your um, things that you would not be able to put into your compost pile because it's going to be a healthy plant. Um, I like marathon, marathon broccoli for a spring plant of broccoli. So right now, um, cause it can go all summer long. It's amazing. You can be eating broccoli all summer after you take that central head off side sprouts all summer long. So that's a good one. It acts differently. If you plant it in, in the fall, fall means August, September, same plant acts differently. So, okay, let's move. On. Oh, my favorite chart in the world. Um, <laughs> I love this chart. <laughs> um, so just go on to the UC Master Gardener Santa Clara County and, and click on their um, vegetable planting chart. And this is all you need to know to um, grow some, some great vegetables. Um, so it, it tells you when you should be doing everything. And right now you can see it's February. Get your arugula in, get your beets in, get your bok choy, get your cabbage your Napa cabbage, everything, um, all those families, you can go ahead and plant uh, right now. It is go time. I color coded it. I look at it. I've, people have heard me say this before. I look at this chart every single day. I have had this chart next to my desk for 15 years and there is not a day that I don't look at it and like, can I put my carrots in now? Could I? And it, it's, um, I live by the sword. I die by the sword. Anyway, I love this chart. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, Kathleen, on planting charts or? Just, this is the best chart there is. I've, I've looked at and tried probably a dozen chart. I looked at the Santa Cruz, because I'm in Santa Cruz now, Master Gardener chart and the, the UC chart for Santa Cruz, and it's ridiculous. I mean, I just, it just, it doesn't even make sense. Yeah. And you can use this chart wherever you are. You might adjust it by a few weeks this way or that way, but this chart works in the general Bay Area. This chart area. works everywhere. Yeah, yeah, I find the same thing. Um, so this is a great, great. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, <laughs> so oh, when I changed corn, Kathleen, I put it in its family. Um, <laughs> so on your left-hand side is all your fruit you know, that's your, your tomatoes and eggplant, peppers, tomatillos, your cucurbit family. Um, and those are your fruiting vegetables. And those are what you're going to be planting pretty quick here, April, May, um, from, from seedlings for, uh, the Soliancia family for cucurbits, just go ahead and put seeds in the ground, cucumbers, winter squash, melons, squirts. It's so much easier just to put seeds in the ground then um, start those in trays and pot them up and then transplant them. So um, anytime I have the opportunity to put seeds in the ground versus starting them inside, that's what I do. With the nightshade family, you have to start them in February. Well, January, February, yeah, February. Um, six weeks before you're going to plant them out. So those I will start um, indoors. Of course, you can buy seedlings. This is starting everything from seed is if you have a, a large area um, and you just can't afford to to be buying seedlings all the time but um, and actually the master gardeners have a April 15th have a sale coming up where you can buy at the um, San Mateo County Fairgrounds you can buy your tomatoes and peppers and eggplant and um, lots and lots of stuff there um, but all, all your stuff right now um, Half Moon Bay Nursery as a really nice vegetable and herb section that um, I highly recommend. There's a yeah. great nursery. There's actually two great nurseries in Santa Cruz, but you're probably not gonna come down here. But if you're coming down anyway, take a left on River Street and right there is San Lorenzo Nursery. <laughs> um, it's an excellent nursery and they have bare root fruit trees. 
in sand. You just pull it out, look at it, decide if you want it or not. They're, they're there right now. I'm going to be buying some tomorrow morning. <laughs> so yeah. awesome. But yeah. Right now, you know, it's too late to start your broccoli and stuff now. You need to buy the seeds, the plants. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we started our broccoli in early January and it's but it's ready to go in the garden now. Um, so what you're planting now, because it's the cool season, is all your brassicas, which are the mustard family, your amaranthaceae family, those you can seed or or look at your chart. It'll tell you if you can put them in this, you know, in the ground right now as a seed. Um, your lettuce family, your carrot family, and your aliums. Um, Eh. aliens are winter grown but those are fall um like uh, garlic is in october planted out um but again just look at your chart it'll tell you what to do you'll notice the warm and the cool the um warm likes it between 65 and 85 the cool between 55 and 75 there is an overlap there from 65 to 75 and and that's the beauty and the horror of california is um you can grow absolutely 100 percent 365 days of the year and you should be growing 365 days of the year um but it's just it's room that is the you know you run you have all your summer stuff still going strong and it's august september and you need to be putting in your your fall garden so that's why i said just interplant just sneak stuff in you'll be taking those tomatoes you're not going to be disturbing the soil and you're just going to cut that tomato or pepper or off and there you have your broccoli growing underneath so um just interplant as much as you can um yeah what else to say about that um how to plant tools and techniques um everybody who knows me knows my little black basket um <laughs> you don't need much i mean you need a soil knife or, or a hand trowel and you need a pair of pruners and it's nice if your pruners are nice pruners, ARS or Falco, um, because you're going to have them the rest of your life. Um, you can switch out the blade, you sharpen the blade. So it's it's nice. Go ahead and invest. I, there's 60 or $70, but it's nice to have a nice pair of pruners. Um, we sharpen it with the DMT diamond sharpener. Kathleen sharpens hers probably every day, Kathleen. Yeah. Yeah, and when she's pruning, probably every hour. But um, Kathleen's an ISA certified arborist, so she does a lot of pruning. Um, so she needs sharp, she needs sharp hand tools. Um, I don't really wear gloves. Um, on occasion, I will, but I don't like gloves. Um, so you can't yeah. feel stuff. Yeah, I like it. I like dirt underneath my nails. I always have dirt underneath my nails. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, how to seed? Um, how to start seed uh yeah you, you had to already start your brass because it's too late for that um uh i'm not going to get into this but you could buy a seed starting mix or you can make your own um and you don't want to bury that seed very far and same with cover crop when you're just broadcasting seed into your garden you want to bury the seed as big as the seed is so a beet seed is an eighth of an inch, you want to bury it about an eighth of an inch. Um, so some people, the main people just like poke that seed all the way down two, three inches. Well, that seed has enough energy in that little tiny seed to pop up, put out a root, put out a stem, put out its little cotyledon leaves, everything it needs in that little is inside that little tiny package. And it has enough nutrition in there to go ahead and get those cotyledon leaves, those little tiny, funny looking leaves out and then get its true leaves out. And then it's out of, then it's out of oomph. So- um, And it needs sunlight. Yeah, it needs sunlight. And it needs to start photosynthesizing. You're putting it into a soilless mix. There's no soil food web there. There's nothing feeding that plant. If I'm ever gonna use a super, super weak um, fertilizer, it would be a fish emulsion, super super diluted if something's not in there i never do it in the ground but if it's in a little pot yeah. um, before you can get it out into the ground that's where i would use a little very very weak fish emulsion or something 
And if you're not going to seed, that's great. Just go buy nice seedlings. They should be as tall as they are wide. They shouldn't have struggled for light. They shouldn't have, and pop them out of the little six packs. Look at their roots, make sure they're healthy. Um, make sure they're happy. That's my son in those <laughs> bottom left hand corner. So we used to run a farm stand for about 10 years. Um, we were farming in Woodside and we ran a little farm stand and he's now 18 years old. And uh, he's, I think he's like five years old there. Uh, and he was the reg he was the cash register guy because he loves money. He loves money. <laughs> say, if, if you never start a seed, don't worry about it. I, I buy all my stuff in six packs and it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. This is um, a little bit more uh, depending on your time and interest and everything else. Um, how to prepare your bed. So we kind of touched on this. What I would like to say is have everything on hand. Don't go buy your seedlings and then get home and say, oh, I don't have any compost. I don't have any mulch. I, you know, have everything on hand. So there's my seedlings in the upper left. My mulch is on the left-hand side. I have some, here I have a little bit of essential soil mix. I mix it with compost, my homemade compost. This is at my house in PV. So this is a home garden. This isn't a farm. Um, I already have mulch on my soil, but I put more mulch on top of my soil. So I'm, yeah, it's maybe an inch of mulch. Um, lay out my little plants. It, to plant a plant, you put your soil knife in, you pull towards yourself, you pop the little plant in. It's a maybe a 10 second, uh, you know, it's a very quick, you can plant a whole row, a 25 foot row. You can plant it in 10 minutes. Um, and then you water it in. There's my dram redhead watering in. So it's like a little rain. So it feels like rain to it. And um, there's my little black gardening basket. And there's my little table and chairs after I finish planting where I get to relax. <laughs> <laughs> and watch my things grow and eat them. Um, bugs, blights, and birds. I do protect against birds. When I plant those little seedlings out, those little brassica seedlings, cover it with bird netting or cover with floating row cover. Um, when they're little babies, they get big pretty quickly, especially, especially fall planted in August, September. They get big right away. And so then you can take it off. It's just when they're tiny little babies. Um, we don't do anything about aphids or white fly. I mean, if they bother you, you can spray them off and then ask yourself why you have aphids. If it's not the end of the life of that plant, you're going to get aphids. The end of the life of a brassica, you're going to get aphids. But ask yourself, do I have too much nitrogen in my soil? What's going on? Um, we did find two uh, tomato hornworms, um, gardener. Ginny found those. <laughs> They're so cool looking. They are so neat. I just, I love them actually. And they're just so squishy. Um, and their little legs go around the stem. You know, just everything about them, I just love. Um, and, you know, okay, you have a hornworm. You know, he ate a tomato, all right. You know, no, no big deal. You know, just just pick him off and um, totally fine. There's no no worry there. Uh, Jenny's a she's a tall gardener and and our our tomatoes got probably eight feet tall and these guys were at eye level for her <laughs> it is honestly it is a little scary when you see it but um <laughs> but anyway I just think they're totally cool um well we will talk about um rats and squirrels and stuff we do use sluggo when we first plant out a brassica a, a row of brassicas we'll put out some sluggo as a prophylactic but we're not going to use sluggo again unless we see slug damage. So got to know the difference between bird damage and slug damage. You need to know what you're looking at. And then the hedgerow. And ahead. don't don't use sluggo plus. Yeah. It um it'll kill the life in your soil. Yeah. And can I, I gonna... say something about leaf miners? Yeah. They're super cool. Yeah. <laughs> they are. They're totally neat. They're totally neat. I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit faster because I see it 7:50 and we want to leave some time for questions. So um, protection from birds, um, you can just like um, my husband made these little cages and we have a cat. You know the cat's super helpful to be honest with you with 
with rats and stuff. So we use exclusion. We don't use other than sluggo. Uh, the only thing we do is exclusion other than trapping. We do trap and um, Brian, yay, Brian, <laughs> he's our trapper. And so we use these cinch traps for gophers. We have gophers at the farm and uh, he's he's amazing. And thank God for Brian. Um, have a heart traps for the squirrels. You cannot relocate any furry animal you are allowed to kill it. You have to kill it through um, nice a nice way. I can't think of a, a nice way to carbon say carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide in a cooler. You're not allowed to drown them. Um, but I'm not going to tell anybody if you do. Um, and <laughs> and um, just exclude deer. I mean, really, what we do is exclusion, other than the trapping of rats, squirrels, and gophers. Um, and there's a good. Um, Janet Moody, she's a master gardener and she has some good videos if you look at the Lingso website on how to trap. Harvesting. Harvesting takes a lot of time. Um, I know, <laughs> Kathleen hates harvesting. I have a team of 12 people who harvest, <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> um, but um, oh, Kathleen and I start almost stopped planting um, cherry tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes are the worst. Um, <laughs> It takes forever. It takes forever. You know, you buy, you grow a big heirloom tomato, like big, like two pound tomato. And it's just like, bonk, you're done to get that poundage and little tiny, you know, little tiny tomatoes takes forever. Yeah, And what are the, what are the little ones even smaller than heirloom? Oh, like oh. grape tomatoes or something. Yeah. They're yeah. sweet 100s. Yeah. Sweet 100s and sun golds are everybody's favorite cherry tomato. But I, um, <laughs> I know. Um, and one little tip, if you can, and I mean, it's a lot of work, but there's a lot of vegetables that are kind of a one and done, you know, beet, a cauliflower. Uh, and if you can do a successive sowing, you know, if you pull a beet, plant a beet. Um, if you can do a successive sowing, it's um, then you, instead of having, you know, eight cauliflower all on the same day, you know, then you can have a cauliflower a week over you know, over a longer period. So it, it, it's a lot of work, but um, if you can successive sow things that are a one and done, tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, cucumbers, um, peas, beans, all of those, the more you harvest, the more you're gonna get. So just keep harvesting, keep harvesting. They're gonna keep producing. Those guys are trying to put on seed heads they are trying to reproduce and you're taking their fruit away. And so they're gonna just keep putting on more fruit. Um, get roots in the ground, weather, drought, and atmospheric river. I think we're getting towards the end here. Mm -hmm. um, we've all been, I mean, we're in climate change. We just are. And so, um, you know, we had five years of drought. And, and then in January, we had three weeks of atmospheric rivers. And I can tell you the solution is the same for both of those. And that's roots in the ground. Get your co soil covered plant plants cover I would I had this part of me cover crop cover crop yeah I mean we did not have we had all those atmospheric rivers we did not have any puddling at the farm we um so get those roots in the soil in summertime they're going to hold like a big reservoir they're going to hold water in the soil and they're going to hold on to that moisture for you and mulch, keep your soil covered. Mulch, either a living mulch with cover crop, or if not, mulch, mulch, wood chips, what uh, any organic matter. Um, and and uh, yeah, and then we just didn't have any puddling. We didn't have any problems. So get roots in the ground for for the climate change, and that kind of is true worldwide. That's not that's not just vegetable gardening. That's everywhere. General gardening trips, and then we will we'll finish up and get some questions and answers. We're gonna save you a hundred dollars, and then we're gonna, <laughs> then and then we're gonna cost you about a thousand dollars. Kathleen and I get called on um, consultations quite frequently, and I can tell you almost every single time we get called out on a consultation, is their mow and blow guy is blowing their soil, and it is making their soil into cement. Leave the leaves, leave the cover, leave the leaf litter put wood chips, put plants, get your soil covered, stop, 
stop blowing stuff off of your soil. It's, it's horrible. Um, so please stop doing that. Now you don't have to hire us. Just stop doing it. <laughs> um, 98% of what a tree make a tree needs, they make in their leaves that drop to the ground, decompose, feed the soil and the tree takes them back up. So leave those leaves. Leave the leaves. Um, hire a professional arborist to prune your fruit trees unless you really, really know what you're doing. Kathleen is a certified arborist. She has been pruning a lot for 15 years or maybe more. Um, we just had Kevin Raftery out to our our orchard in Woodside, and um, I, I swear, learned more stuff. I learned. I every single time I listen to that man, I learn more. I bow to him. I bow to his feet. He is. He he's been pruning probably every day for 50 years. He knows what he's talking about. So do yourself a, a favor and hire a pruner. Cover your soil. Okay, we covered that. Mythbusters. We do not pull weeds. We leave roots in the soil. We cut them off at soil level. We don't use fertilizer ever. Um, I'm not saying you can't, but it's just you don't need to. Um, February, I call it National Weeding Month. Cut those roots, cut those um, weeds at soil level. And um, you can spray them with vinegar if, if, uh, if you want to. But, um, but weeds are a cover crop. So, I mean, we leave our, you know, we leave our weeds unless they're going to be um, a real issue like mallow. It gets a big, big um, tap root. We dig a little bit and we cut it maybe an inch um, under soil level, but we, uh, we leave those roots in and have fun. That's the main thing. Have fun. Yay. <laughs> there's the farm and there's some of the gardeners and a cauliflower we grew. We just harvested that probably, I don't know, a couple of weeks or two ago. Um, and then use your garden like a, a grocery store, you know, go out, what's for dinner? Well, let's go look in the garden. You know, what's, oh, well, we've got some sugar snap peas right now. We'll do a stir fry or, um, I really, honestly, I do. I use my garden just like I would my, um, you know, a refrigerator. Uh, we're on to questions and answers. So I think Tom is going to hop back on. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and that's from chat. And I think Tom is going to feed those questions to us. Yes, thank you. Um, so we've got a lot of questions here. Um, someone's asking, should we put seeds in the ground now for squash? No. Oh, no. no. Just look at the planting chart. So I'm gonna, I have it right here. <laughs> so let me, <laughs> let me look at it for, for uh, summer and winter squash. You're going to put seeds in the ground in May on that. Okay. And can you use oak leaves for mulch? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. My best compost I've ever made was uh, an experiment I did with Kathleen and um, Terry Ling. So I just got a, a bin, a chicken wire bin, and I put just oak leaves, nothing but oak leaves in it. I left it for three years and I came back and it was the nicest compost I have ever made. It's just beautiful. Fantastic. Then um, this person has lots of different kale plants every year. Some years it grows like crazy and other years it gets eaten down to the ground. I have been told it's a cabbage beetle. Any suggestions? Oh, might be a cabbage moth. Uh, they're oh, yeah, white and they have worms. little, look for little green worms. Yeah. Yeah. At, when they're seedlings, you can just look at the opposite side of the leaf and you'll see a little fat caterpillar <laughs> who loves to eat. And, and you can just take them and squish them. Um, but it probably is the uh, cabbage moth. And, and then it becomes this white moth with two little black spots on its shoulders. Okay. Um, this person has tried leaving the roots in all of in the ground from prior harvest and cutting the remnants off of the roots. How do you plant seeds when you have all these roots remnants? You want to take that, Kathleen? Sure. Those, those roots are dead and they're going to decompose fairly quickly. Just go ahead and put your seeds in there, cover them up with a little bit of compost or mulch and you're good to go. Yeah. And Kathleen made me do an experiment that I didn't want to do. <laughs> Sisters are like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, um, 
it was at a client's house too. Um, there was a fruit tree was not doing well, cut off at soil level, leave the roots on. We planted another fruit tree, bare roots, right on top of that tree and um, and put some put some compost and mulch around its roots. And I thought, yeah. I mean, a tree, it's a tree, it's woody and um, did beautifully, did amazingly well. Yeah, it's organic matter. Yeah, it's, it's the, leaving the roots in the ground. What you're doing is you're just adding organic matter to your soil. Which is the best thing to do. Um, and then we have a question, how to fertilize fruit trees? We don't, but um, <laughs> we put compost around their their root, uh, around the drip line of their roots. We put the compost with some mulch, and we cover crop. We cover crop like crazy in our orchards. Kathleen, do you have more you want to say? No, I I planted five bare root fruit trees yesterday, and um, found, put them on a mound. Put some uh, nature seed, California mix, little mulch, good to go. I, I've never fertilized my fruit trees. The, the problem with fertilizing, um, I'll, I'll just say, please don't ever use non-organic fertilizer chemicals. But if, if you feel very, very compelled to use an organic fertilizer, unfortunately, what you're doing is you're taking the job away from the microbes. The microbes want to feed that plant. And so when you unemploy all those microbes, they're like, we're not needed here anymore. Uh, you guys don't want us. And they're going to start dying off because something else is giving that plant nitrogen and phosphorus and calcium and zinc. And, and so you don't want to unemploy all those microbes. You want to keep them employed. And that's why we keep emphasizing have roots in the ground. The more the diversity of roots you have in the ground, it's going to feed a much wider range of microbes in your soil. And that's what's going to keep that plant alive and healthy. So you don't want those microbes to give up. You don't want them. Oh, somebody else is giving that plant nitrogen. I don't have to anymore. Um, well, you want the, it. What happens is a plant quits giving that carbon to the soil because it doesn't need to anymore. So your soil dies, actually. So it's it's. We, we can't really, recommend it. Yeah, it's it's really negative. And before World War II, and they had all these extra um, nitrogen for bombs, nobody fertilized because they just didn't. They used their animals' manure and they cover cropped. And so we need to get back to how it used to be before bombs. <laughs> before war. Yeah. Look, there is one weed I pull. Oh, I what? Oh, I okay. Pull oxalis. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, I don't, but yeah. you do. Yeah. Because I want the bulblet so I can do the bulblet dance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, during, during your talk, you spoke a lot about mulch. And there's all kinds of, if you go to any garden place or nursery, you see mulch in bags. So is there good mulch and bad mulch? Or how do you know what mulch you might find in a nursery or in a commercial establishment that you should be taking advantage of? Go ahead, Kathleen. In Mississippi, they like rubber mulch a lot. Like ground up tires? Yes, oh. it's very, very popular. Hmm. In fact, um, they were going to use it in a landscape we were paying for, and I said no. Yeah. So yes. anything organic for a mulch is great. Yeah. You can get free mulch from an arborist. You can get mulch at any garden center. I, I actually use what's called a soil conditioner, but it's just a, a finer woody substance. I use G and B soil conditioner, but any organic matter is a great mulch. Yeah, just keep the soil covered. But uh, you can see right behind you, Tom, those are just free wood chips from an arborist. Um, so all our paths are just um, free mulch that we get from, I just call Eddie, the wood chip guy, and he comes and brings me, <laughs> he comes and brings me free mulch. In my garden itself, uh, the garden beds, 
I, I always have living, I have living mulch because of the heavy cover crops, but if it's a brand new row and the cover crops haven't germinated yet, I'll put um, a little bit of hay or a little bit of alpha, alpha or a little bit of straw and I'll chop it up pretty fine, one to two inch pieces. And I'll, I'll put that just so the soil's covered before that cover crop comes up. And you'll hear people say, oh, don't, you know, hay is for horses and straw is for mulch. But um, I'm trying to get more seeds into my ground. So I don't mind using hay. Hay has a seed head on it. And I don't mind the seed head because I'm trying to grow more grasses. I'm trying to, to me, that's free. I, then I don't have to sit there and, and cover crop quite as much. So, um, and also there's a misconception that you just cover crop once a year. We cover crop all the time. We're constantly, we're constantly throwing seeds out to, to cover crop. And there's no time when, there, there's no time when you can't. Good. Well, I want to um, thank you both for finding the time to join us this evening. I know it was extremely informative and from all of the questions um, that we got this evening, as well as a large audience. So um, thank you uh, again uh, for being a part of us. This is the second time that we've had you uh, for our first Friday, we did the great pruning one. So it's nice to have you back at uh, this time of year and get all these tips to help people improve the quality of their garden. I, uh, I'm lucky I'm married to a master gardener and so I uh, am lucky to get all of the fruits of uh, her labor <laughs> and my labor. Uh, so uh, gardening is an exciting way of doing, um, bringing life um, to everything and being able to enjoy it um, with our meals. So that's even better. So um, thank you again for joining us. I'd like to remind um, all of our audience that next month we have uh, something completely different. We have uh, someone local uh, in a different way. We have Tyler McNibbins coming back from Bucks and he'll be giving us a presentation uh, next month. So thank you all for joining us. And just to finish up here, um, a couple of quotes. Um, Let us not forget that the cultivation of the earth is the most important labor of man. When planting begins, other arts follow. The farmers, therefore, are the founders of civilization. That's from Daniel Webster. And Margaret Art Artwood said, in the spring, at the end of the day, you should smell like dirt. And I love that quote. And to finish off from a former president, no occupation is so delightful to me as the culture of the earth. No culture comparable to that of the garden. That was Thomas Jefferson. And he should know he had some great gardens. So um, thank you again for being a part of First Friday. Thank you all of our audience out there. We greatly appreciate the fact that you take time out to be a part of First Friday. We wouldn't do it if you weren't there. And remember, take care of yourself and more importantly, take care of each other. So good night and thank you for joining us. See you next month.